Hello and welcome to the Cosm Podcast. I'm your host, Tyler James Berger. On this episode, we talk to Tom Roberts, who is a professor of educational psychology at Northern Illinois University, where he taught one of the first accredited classes on psychedelics back in 1981. In 1985, Dr. Roberts originated the celebration known as Bicycle Day, celebrating the first intentional dose of LSD by its discoverer, Dr. Albert Hoffman. It was Tom Roberts who coined the name Bicycle Day, a story we spoke about on our Bicycle Day podcast. In this extended interview, Dr. Roberts speaks about his recent book, Mind Apps, Multi-State Theory and Tools for Mind Design, a book that characterizes psychedelics as educational tools, as well as the potential that psychedelics have to reform modern religious practice. Please welcome Dr. Tom Roberts. Sitting here with Professor Tom Roberts, it's uh, it's such an honor to have you on the Cosm Podcast. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. This um, being um, hunkered down at home has not made really much difference in my life because I'm not working. There you go. It just gives you some more time to read more books and you know study more things, right? So that's right. Yeah, I'm really uh, I'm really excited to talk to you. Uh, We are here on the occasion that April 19th is a holiday now known as Bicycle Day, which is a celebration that you started back in 1985. Uh, Can you tell us a little bit about the genesis of Bicycle Day and why you decided to make this a day worth celebrating? Yeah, the idea just occurred to me, I don't remember exactly how or when, that we ought to have a holiday for psychedelicists. And I was going to have it on the on April 16th, which is when Hoffman took his first accidental dose. But that was in the middle of the week that week and not a good day for a party. So I moved it up to the 19th and decided to call it his first intentional psychedelic trip. And that's the one that he really described in more detail. So I did it. There wasn't a sense of sort of feeling a need for this and then coming up with the solution. It just the solution popped in my mind. I sort of made up reasons for it afterwards. Mm-hmm. So anyway, it's just about the right thing to do when I did it. So I had no idea that it would catch on. I don't even know if I thought I'd have it uh, in subsequent years. Probably, but I, I didn't know. I didn't pay much attention to it at that time because I really wasn't, I was just getting together with some friends. And that's the way it started. Now, why did you choose to call it Bicycle Day? as opposed to like just LSD day. That's just what Albert Hoffman asked. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah um, well, um, somehow the idea of him riding a bicycle is more visual to me than, you know, a, a, a sort of steady sort of a drawing of a, of, a, of a chemical structure. You know, and, 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 and also he talks about riding home and being accompanied and, I mean, the chemical structure was sort of like there. But he, he asked the same question. He said, why do Americans focus on these sort of side things like the bicycle day? A bicycle should be called LSD day or something like that. And so he and I started a conversation or communications back and forth by actually written mail in those days. Wow. And, and um, so I explained to him that, um, you know, I thought it was a, a better image and more active image. And also that, um, you know, people could visualize somebody riding a bicycle more than just a sort of sta- static um, chemical structure. And also I thought of afterwards was that um, also it, it, the 19th of April here would be, uh, or rather here would be the 18th of April, or 19th of April there would be the 18th of April. And there's that famous poem by Paul Revere is the 18th of April in 75 and hardly a man is still alive who remembered the famous day and year and the midnight ride of Paul Revere. And of course, both of them are sort of revolution starting events. Mm-hmm. And it would have been the 18th here would have been the 19th in Switzerland. So I told him and um, he, he, he came around to it. He, he understood it wasn't just a matter of paying attention to the bicycle. I actually, uh, actually offered to buy the bicycle phone if he still had it, but he doesn't still have it. So, 
So wow, that would, that would be quite the relic. It really would. That's just what I thought. Yeah. But he, I'm sad he didn't have it anymore. That, 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 as you say, that would be a great relic to have. Mm -hmm. Now, what are your... Anyway, that's, that's how it started. And I invited some friends over and we had a... Actually, it was kind of... It wasn't a very sort of hippie, wild day at all. It was very... We had uh, people from... There were children with us from families and we just kind of hung out together. Mm -hmm. Now, what is your... Uh, uh, opinion on how Bicycle Day has proliferated all over the world as this uh, holiday for the psychonauts to come together and talk about the legacy of Albert Hoffman. I am absolutely delighted. I mean, I had no idea it would catch on the way it had. Um, uh, one of my former students actually brought, uh, wrote the notice that I sent out to people, and I've sent it out ever since, I don't know, would have been probably 87, 88, something like that. And I understood to the math people, the math people send that out. So that got to a lot of people. And then I wrote it to the friends and friends sent it to friends. And I'm really delighted. Also, I'm a, a little annoyed by it um, because I consider my major work to be my books and my ideas in the books. But what's caught on is Bicycle Day. <laughs> so well, there's the world for you. So at any rate, I'm really delighted. And each year, you know, I, I pick up things on other places that are going on. I mean, like in Europe and all over the place, they have Bicycle Day. So it's really very gratifying to see that. So I guess, you know, my ideas may be very good, but what, what are my real contribution is going to be Bicycle Day. Mm -hmm. Now, when did you first become interested in studying psychedelics? Well, it sort of, I, I'm not someone who changes directions fast, so a number of little things happen. When I was a grad student at the University of Connecticut, that was in 1965, 6, and 7, that's, that's when Timothy Leary was getting in the news. So I wrote to the Harvard, um, and I got a copy of the Harvard Review or whatever it was. There was an article about him, and I read it, but I mean, it wasn't about me. It was about something going on at another university. And then um, I moved to um, Stanford in uh, 1967 to go to graduate school. And um, I was writing my dissertation on Maslow's needs hierarchy. And there's a, a professor, Willis Harmon, who had studied Maslow, and I wanted to have a class with him. And he taught a, a special course, what was called graduate special, called Psychedelic Potential or Human Potential. And so I, I signed up for it. And I was, you know, um, there was, this is also when things were going on in San Francisco, but they were like, like interesting background noise to me. I wasn't for me. I was in graduate school, you know, being a graduate student and doing all the graduate student stuff. But there was that noise in the background and, um, and you know, a little bit of stuff going on in Stanford, but not much. But then in one of the class meetings, there was a married couple in there who talked about the first psychedelic class meeting or experience. And that's the first I'd ever heard anybody talk about the experience. And now this was a, a, a graduate special class at Stanford, and it had students, graduate students from all over Stanford. So this is an advanced class for very advanced students at a major university. There are a lot of engineering students in there and humanities people and pe people all over the place. And much to my surprise, half or three quarters of the class joined in that conversation and started to talk about their own psychedelic experiences. And this didn't fit into what I thought I knew at all. I mean, I've been taught like everybody else, you know, drug takers are these dirty, screwy-eyed, brain-scrambled people, and yet these were advanced graduate students at a major university who were talking about their experience. So that really sort of jolted my mind about it. Um, but I hadn't had any yet. This was like 1968. And a guy in the class gave me a ticket to hear a speaker that I didn't know anything about him, but it was free, and I thought I'd go and hear it. And... Um, it was about um, religion, East and West. I thought, well, you know, I'll go, and if it's boring, I'll leave. But it was Ellen Watts, and it was talking about religion, East and West, and psychedelics. And, and Ellen Watts was like erudite and witty and bright and everything you'd want a speaker to be. So I realized that, you know, you could get into this in a non-hippie sort of way. And, and so that, sort of, that, that's, that jolted me again. But I had my first experience in February 1970.
So actually, I, I had had experience with the ideas and exposure to the ideas before that, before my own experience. And so that was up at Lake Tahoe in 1970. And that, of course, really set my direction. Wow. So good, good luck throughout there, just running into the right people at the right time. Yeah, I mean, Alan Watts uh, is such an amazing introduction into the world of psychedelics for so many people. Um, and he, I'm, I'm so glad he still lives on through the internet, uh, where people today can still look up his words and, and find direction uh, through his wisdom. That's amazing that you got to see him talk. Yeah, just, just plain, plain good luck, that's all. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I wanted to shift the conversation a little bit about uh, some of your writing, uh, particularly Mind Apps and your other book, The Psychedelic Future of the Mind. Um, so, you know, speaking to the future, um, I want to talk to you about the future of psychedelics. And though LSD is most often discussed these, these days in terms of its psychotherapeutic or entheogenic potential, uh, you speak about LSD's potential for what you call mind design, playing yeah. a role in learning, cognitive enhancement, and problem solving. Uh, can you explain this idea of mind design and how psychedelics can play a role in cognitive enhancement? Yeah, in getting there, it's important to talk about the idea of what I call a mind app. And the analogy I use is that just that we can, we can install apps on our devices and they can do more things and, and be more powerful. We can, do, we can install apps in our brain-mind complex. But I'm not talking about electronic stuff. I say anything that we put into our brain-mind complex that changes the way it functions. And psychedelics, of course, are the big one. They include meditation, and breathing techniques and biofeedback and neurofeedback. And there are, there are dozens of them. And they're being actually being invented all the day, every day. So what I'm seeing is that instead of talking about these things as like all on the fringes of psychology, it's to recognize that our brain-mind complex can work in a number of different ways, just as our devices can work in a number of different ways. And we can do different things with them. So what we can do is, and I'm using the, analogy, install them, like take some psychedelics or try meditation or whatever, into our brain-mind complex, and they will function differently and have different abilities, just like our devices do. So psychedelics are the main mind, mind app that I'm interested in, but there are all these dozens, if probably hundreds and thousands of others. And new ones are being imported from like Ibogaine and Ayahuasca are good examples, or discoveries about the brain, which are done for medical reasons, also our way of using, of, of installing new mind apps into our brain. So this is a very big development. So what I'm thinking of is that the main thing is to recognize we can use our brain-mind complex in a lot of different ways. Now, the interesting thing is we, we usually use them one at a time, like you take psychedelics or you do meditation or do chanting or do yoga or the martial arts. And each time you do that, you develop a new... Um, mind-body state. I use the word mind-body state rather than state of consciousness because consciousness is a word that has a lot of different meanings. So when, what, but what hasn't been talked about much is what happens when you combine them? What happens if you combine psychedelics with hypnosis and say brain stimulation electronically? You develop a mind-body state that's never been invented before. So it would be a synthetic state of consciousness. And who knows what that might be good for? Um, just as in, in chemistry, there are a lot of synthetic um, uh, molecules, and some of them are, are very good. Most of them are just kind of curiosity, but the ones that are important are really important. So there may be mind-body states that we can invent that is designed. There'll be ways to using our minds in new ways, just so we can use our devices in new ways when we install new apps in them. So I call them mind apps, just like just like uh, apps for the devices. So mm -hmm. that's where that word comes from. And now, that's the big opening to, for the future of the of mind development, because there's an unlimited number of recipes for putting these things together, not only different ones, but, but different doses or different strengths of them. So if you think of them as being like, like uh, chemistry, you can put an, the, the elements together in, an, in diff 
amazing number of different molecules and have you know different atoms of each in there so the same thing is with our brain but who knows what's going to be in there that's the big idea yeah it's, it seems like you're looking at um uh each unique state of consciousness that we can trigger through any variety of means as a tool within itself to use different states of the mind body complex uh, as a particular tool that can be used for particular problems. Um, right. now, now, a question that arises in my mind is how translatable are um, some things that you learn in one state of consciousness to uh, a sober state of consciousness. You know, there's this idea of state-specific learning. You know, yeah. they, they say that if you are studying while drinking coffee, you should uh, drink some coffee while you're taking your test because caffeine creates a state that then makes that learning bound to that particular chemical in your brain. Um, how do we get certain... Um, things that we learn in one mind-body complex to translate to our quote-unquote sober state of consciousness. If you'd like to write a couple hundred dissertations, you've got your topics right there. How do we translate from one state? What's sometimes, remembering dreams is a good example of this. Wake up in the morning, we know we've had a dream. We probably can't remember or just remember little bits of it. Now, in, in me, it's like around 10.30 in the morning, suddenly I'll remember and the whole thing will download. So can we do that with from different mind-body states? And this is, is, is this a skill we can learn? I mean, you can learn to remember your dreams, okay? So that's, that's a lead there. And probably some states will have information and ideas that can be transferred to other states and, and some not. And, but, but this is like work that has to be done. So um, I think that's a, a great, a great question. And it's really the center of the question. Now there's some instances that have, that have happened. Um, the guy, um, uh, Kerry Mallis, who, who invented the PCR technique, okay, learned in tripping to visualize. This is something a lot of people learn. Um, maybe it's people who are highly verbal learn to visualize more, I'm not, not sure. But in any case, they, 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 during psychedelic experiences, they learned to visualize. And he carried that visualization ability back to his ordinary state. And that's where he came up with the idea of the PCR technique. So there's an example of a skill and a kind of cognitive enhancement. You, can you learn something in one state and then transfer it back? For example, and meditators say that the way they learn to control their mind and use their mind while meditation can be transferred back to the ordinary state. So the question is, when, when can you uh, transfer? Can you learn to transfer more? Um, are there some states that don't transfer and some that do? Um, so these are all questions that need to be, uh, that need to be really systematically investigated. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I really like about thinking about this mind state idea and mind design is there are an infinite number of enormously important and very intriguing questions to look at. And that's what I'm trying to get people in the academic world to recognize those questions and start to investigate them rather than just sort of pass off alter states as, oh, that junky kind of idea. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah, I think that speaks to why the word integration is such a key word in the world of psychedelics. You know, uh, it, what is learned in one state always, always needs to be integrated back into your mm -hmm normal state, whatever that means. Um, now, my next question is, uh, you know, we talk about psychedelics broadly, um, but there's so much variance between each psychedelic. And what um, do you think is um, some, how, you know, how does LSD differ from other psychedelics in its potential for um, mind design? Well, I think um, probably um, psilocybin and mescaline and psychedelics are going to be pretty much the same depending on the dose. But when we move over to other things like ibogaine and ayahuasca and MDMA, I don't consider them really psychedelics. I consider the, the first three plus toad um, stuff as being sort of the psychedelic family. 
but these others are sort of adopted into the family. So MDMA isn't really a psychedelic, but it's been adopted into the psychedelic family. And the same with Ibogaine. So those and those questions really have to be looked at. And and, uh, and part of the thing of studying different mind-body states is to ask what different, for example, let's say in logical reasoning or perception, how will these vary from state to state? And they'll give us a sort of diagram of how these different states are related to each other. And a lot of them will like overlap a lot, like mescaline or LSD, and some of them won't overlap much at all. And that's a question we have to look at and, and, so, and determine that. Another thing, uh, it'll probably vary from person to person. And it's likely to vary, of course, according to set and setting. I mean, there are always big variables um, that, will, will, that will change all the time. It's a very complex area to look at. And all these things that need, really need to be looked at. And I think that probably, uh, for, I haven't done, D, uh, haven't done um, DMT. I'm a little old for that. Um, and so um, I, I, I sort of would be interested in it, but I don't think my body would be able to handle that. My, my liver and my kidneys aren't what they were 30 and 40 years ago. So I'll just have to go on saying of people who've done that. So um, that's an intriguing one. And apparently people are able to remember their experiences and bring them back. So also, um, we may be able to learn to remember things that happen in one state and bring it back. That's that, that transfer question. Hmm. But again, um, again, people are going to vary in this, like everything else. Some people will probably do it very easily and very well, and some people not at all, and most of us in the middle. Wow. Now, I want to kind of move the conversation to the intersection of psychedelics and religion. Um, now, it seems that uh, it seems that the original religions that have formed around the use of sacramental substances are, in a way, cultural techniques of mind design, utilizing psychedelics as tools for that purpose. Uh, what is your perspective on the archaic religious use of psychedelics as a form of mind design? Um, I'm, I'm all in favor of, of, of using whatever combination of things will work with people. My, one of my major interests, I spent about five years on this, maybe six or seven, was on the uh, entheogenic use of psychedelics. By the way, I reserve the word entheogen for the spiritual and religious use of psychedelics. I don't use it as a synonym for psychedelic. I think the word psychedelic with psyche in it, that means mind, and theogen with theo in it means religion. So I think psychedelic is the, the large category and underneath it are, are entheogens and then I use in diet, in ideogen and, uh, and, the, and aesthetogen for aesthetics. So when I'm talking about psychedelics, I mean the broad development of the mind in every way. Um, but, um, I think most of, most of, probably the most fascinating idea for me is the fact that one can have intense mystical experiences with psychedelics. Now, most mystical experiences are not psychedelic, okay? But now, thanks to psychedelics, we can pretty well produce them. And I think this has gotten me interested in religion, not in the sense of joining a particular church or joining a particular cult, but in the fact as, as understanding why people are interested in religion, at least why people who have psychedelic experiences are interested in religion. And um, that is, is really intriguing. And of course, there's a lot of good, there's a lot of very good literature on uh, religion and the entheogens in religion. And that's actually getting better all the time. So I find that as a really big advance. What I'm interested in is, will divinity schools and, and uh, philosophy religion and sociology religion, psychology religion, start, let's say, to have lab experiences, or at least talk about these experiences to their own students. Because if we're gonna study religion, we should study it in all its richness. And its richness certainly includes the entheogenic uh, approaches to religion. And religion is sort of slow on this. There are a number of scholars and clergymen here and there who are interested in psychedelics. They have to look out because their jobs are, are can be at risk because clergy are either hired by a central person like a bishop 
or they're hired by a, a congregation. And if the bishop doesn't, bishop doesn't like what they're doing or the congregation gets angry, they could lose their job. So they have to approach this rather quietly. In Johns Hopkins though, and at um, Langor Medical School in New York City, they actually have um, recruited clergy to come and go through these experiences and to try to understand them. I think that's a really hot area to get into. Um, great, because um, what, what would religion do if suddenly, you know, psychedelic and theogenic religions are, experiences are available to people in general? And there's all kinds of difficult questions. Like in the research is done in medicine, basically they're done in medical schools and doctors are in hand and professionals who are, know how to handle situations. But who's going to decide who the appropriate person is and who's able to give a religious psychedelic experience? I don't think any clergyman would be, you know, at random would be good at that. Um, it's handy to have a doctor or a medical person around. On the other hand, if the government sets the standards for what's necessary for somebody in a religious situation to give or not to give psychedelics, that's government determining what religion can be. And then all the, the religious freedom issues come up at this point. And the number of issues in this are just incredible. And um, the, the, if we think there are problems between religion and government now, wait till we get into psychedelics or theogens and religious and government. So they're great. Any sort of lawyer who wants to get into this as a field uh, has a great possibility to, to get into there. Although probably not too many clients would hire him right yet. But it's just incredible. Um, for instance, I, I was reared in a very traditional congregational church, very rational in Connecticut. And um, after I had one of my psychedelic experiences, not, not the early ones, but several steps into them, I could really understand why people got an interest in religion from that perspective. So I'm interested in religion from an intellectual understanding point of view, not from a, this is the, you know, the savior of humanity sort of point of view. Yeah, it seems like the, uh, the issue kind of boils down to this idea of cognitive liberty, you know, that we should have the freedom to have these experiences. And I think that um, psychedelics pose this uh, opportunity to kind of reform religion, you know, reform religion so that they are based on your personal experience rather than your religion being based off of someone else's experience, you know, it has a yeah. way of decentralizing religion um, and allowing each individual person to have their own um, experience of truth and experience of the divine. I think we may be on to the beginning of a second reformation. Like when Gutenberg printed the Bible, that sort of made holy texts available to the general population. And since then we've had the, you know, the Protestant Reformation and the Counter-Reformation, and these things are still developing all the time. So what Gutenberg did is to sort of expand religion by making texts available. I think what we're doing now is expanding religion by making mystical experiences available. And this would be the same kind of type of transition in, in democratizing. Originally, we democratized religious text, and now we're democratizing religious experience. I have no idea where this is going to go. Um, but, but one of the things I don't like about being old is I'm not going to live another 50 years to find out. Well, in the meantime, we can keep, um, you know, celebrating the holidays that have bubbled up naturally, like Bicycle Day. And thank you so much for your contribution with that. And thank you so much for uh, being on the Cosm podcast. It was a pleasure talking with you. Thanks again for listening to the Cosm podcast. To learn more, please visit Cosm.org. And be sure to follow Chapel of Sacred Mirrors on Instagram and Facebook to stay up to date on future podcasts and virtual events. And please consider making a donation. Your help sponsors inspiring and uplifting offerings to the Love Tribe. A contribution of any size is a stand for the future of Cosm. And thank you to DECA for the soundtrack to this podcast. You can find DECA on YouTube, Spotify, and Bandcamp. 